Um, OK, so let's begin. So uh, in your homework assignments, uh, I asked you to turn in just the JavaScript code. Now, some of you might be asking yourself, well, how? So far, we've mainly been writing JavaScript inside of script tags within our HTML. So it turns out you can actually store your JavaScript as a separate file and then refer to it and then refer to it from your HTML. So here's how you can do that. So you create a, an HTML file. So let's put in the script tag, which you all know and love. Oop, let me make this a little bigger. OK. So we make a script tag. We all know that. But in here, instead of writing our code right here, instead what we'll do is we'll add a reference, a source, if you will, to the file where we're actually going to write our JavaScript. So let us do you know, stars.js and save that. So I will save that on my desktop as stars.html. Saved. Now I make a different file. Now this is the file I'm actually going to check into the cert, into Git as my homework assignment. So this is where I'll actually write, you know, const f, you know, some function, which I'll call. And it will, let's say, console.log, hi. There. Now I'll save that as stars.js. JS for JavaScript. There was a missing letter. Function. No, 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 in the function. Oh, in the function. Okay, we'll find out. In the, ah, there is. Perfect. So I save that. Now, if I run stars, let me run stars. So uh, hang on. Let me go to my desktop, find stars. St stars, here we go. Okay. I don't see anything, but if I open up my console and I go to console, I see hi. Right? So the HTML that's being rendered here is this. Sorry, is this. So here I can say h1, hello everyone. See? This is the HTML. Inside of it, there's a script tag, and the script tag references or refers to the file in which I have my JavaScript code. There it is. Does that make sense? OK. When you submit your assignments, you do not have to submit the HTML. Just submit the JS. If you submit the HTML, it's OK. But what matters is, is that I get a file called stars.js, which has all of your stars code, and a factorial JS that has your factorial function. That's it. And you can test these, this JavaScript in this way. Uh, questions about this? Anyone didn't understand what I just showed you? So, yes. Like yeah. So in the console, you, you draw the star. Yeah. Um, any questions? Is that clear? OK, good. So let's begin. OK, so, uh, so far we've covered values. And the values that we've covered have been numbers, they've been text, and they've been functions, right? And booleans, I think, was the other one. Um, we focused mainly on functions for the last two weeks. Uh, we talked about recursion. We talked about how you can create a loop, a cycle, right, using recursion which is just a fancy way of saying having functions call each other to create a cycle. We talked about how this cycle needs to have a termination case or something in the code that will stop it. Otherwise, it will loop forever, right? Uh, and we end up with what's known as an infinite loop. Okay, so every recursive call, generally speaking, has a termination case or the case that will stop the cycle and the part of the code that will actually make the cycle, the part that will actually call a function to create this loop, okay? So this is what we've done up until this point. And in your homework assignments, your goal will be to further mm, discuss this topic using your YouTube videos, and then of course, to do the homework assignments. Um, so today, I wanna change topics a little bit and talk about objects. So in JavaScript, we have this notion of an object. 
which sounds like very fancy, but it's very simple. It's just a container in which you can store values by their name. So here's what I mean by this. So let me zoom in a bit. Okay, so here's an example. So the way to create one of these objects is to open up a curly brace and close the curly brace. Okay, so this, I just made an object and put it into B. Simple, right? Now, it, like I said, within the object, you can store values by their names. So in this case, I have this object that has in it a name called name and a value called Ruben Meshchan. I have an age referring to a label age, which has a value of a number you are not going to see. <laughs> it has organization, but here's the cool part. In addition to being able to store literal values, you can also store reference to other functions. So, uh, sorry, and other objects. So you can have an object inside of another object. So the name organization references this object, which inside has a name and a value, a name and a value, a name and a value. Make sense? Okay. So let's construct an object in which we will store information about our university. So what's some information that we want to store name, about? Name. name. Okay, so the name of that is name, right? The label we want to give that is name. And let's just be quick, A AUA, whatever. Okay, something else. Location. Baramyan Street, whatever. Okay, good. What's another thing I can store about it? Hmm? Uh, 25 what? A age? Whatever. I, I realize that things can't have ages. Whatever. 25? All right, good. Okay. One thing that you will notice, pay attention to the syntax. After every key value pair, so key is the label. You will often refer, you'll hear this notion of key value pair. A key value pair is nothing more than a pair of a key, which is the name, and a value. Okay, key value pair, key value, key value, key value. Every key value pair has a comma between it. Pay attention to that. If you don't put a comma, you get a syntax error. One thing you guys should notice, um, in your code, if you get syntax errors, that's not a bug. Uh, people often, especially when they're starting programming, they say, oh, I have a bug in my code, it doesn't run, uh, it's all errors. If you have syntax errors, that's just you not knowing how to program. It's not, a, it's not a bug. A bug is an error in the logic. Okay, so there's a difference between a syntax error, which is just a mistake in how you write, and a bug, which is actual logical error, which is actually much more difficult to debug or to fix. Okay, so we get it. We have this awesome container, and inside of this container, we can put key value pairs, so labels and values. Is this clear? Yes. Good. Inside of that, we can put, just like we can put age, 25, we can put foo, some label, and then put in another container, inside of which we can put bar and another container, inside of which we can put zoo and another container. And inside of any of these containers, we can put a set of key value pairs, that is to say labels and values. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. So the next question is, okay, we can construct this object, this container, inside of which we can put all this stuff. The next obvious question is, how do we read it, right? We put all the stuff into it, now how do we actually get it out? How do we read it? So the way to read it is you just refer to it. So the name of this object is data. That's right, that's the name. That's the variable we gave, the name we gave to this object, right? We do dot, 
and then the name of the key for which we want a value. So let's suppose I want to get 25. What is the name of the key for age? age. That's it. So let's console log that. Hang on. Voila. If I wanted to get uh, location, there you go. Now here's an interesting one. Suppose I wanted to get, wow. What do you think I would do? Make sense? So the dot notation allows you to drill into every, right? So data.foo, this part here, this, returns this object, right? It refers to that object. So therefore, within that object, we do dot wow to then, dot wow, to then get this is fun. Clear? Good. OK. So this is the idea of objects. That's it. Ta-da! We know objects. OK. Objects can also store other values. A function, remember, in JavaScript is a value. So what that means is that I can create a, an object and then put in key value pairs. Pow, function. Circle, function. That's the key, that's the value. That's the key, that's the value. Make sense? All right, so we have the key, we have the value. And the value can be a function. So what this means is that suppose I want to call the value referred to by pow. What would I do? Math.pow. Exactly. Math dot. Like that, right? That printed a function. Why? Right, because pow refers to the function, right? So in order for me to run the function, I have to tell it to run. I tell it to run. Ah. Now pow uh, needs values, right? It needs a base value, let's say two, and an exponent, let's say three. And now it computes the power of, you know, two, what is it, two to the power of three and gives eight. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, it turns out that um, in my experience, it, when writing JavaScript, it's a good idea to keep objects that have your functions separate from objects that have your data. Okay, this is actually a key point. In Java, which we'll learn very soon, it's actually a mix. You have methods and attributes. So you have functions and the data kind of put into one class that then becomes an object. So think of it as object for now. Um, what I would like you to do is to always keep them, at least in JavaScript, separate. And here's why. Uh, while you can send data, data being numbers and text, that sort of thing, to a server, or get data from the server, you cannot send uh, data as functions, because the server may not know what a function is. It may be written in another language, like Java, like Java or Python or something, and the syntax won't match. So generally speaking, what we do is we communicate using just plain data, just strings and text and that's, or numbers, that kind of thing. But we keep functions separately so that we can use them. What I just said will make much more sense to you moving forward. Don't worry if that did not for now. But just listen to what I'm saying. Store functions in ob separate objects from the objects that have your data. Just remember that for now. That's all you need. Okay. So, good. We know how to store data. Good. Let's keep going. That's, actually, that's it. That's all I had for objects. Yay. So, objects have key value pairings where the key is a label and the value is a number, text, function, boolean, another object, etc. Clear? Okay, that's all you have to know for objects for now. The next thing is arrays. So an array is basically a list. 
So suppose you want to store a list of things, such as, well, let's suppose I want to store a list of numbers. So in this case, I'm storing a list of numbers, one, two, three, four, and five. Notice that in order to construct an array, that is to say, in order to create an array, I use the brackets. See these? In contrast to an object, I would use curly braces. Okay? So curly braces construct objects, brackets construct arrays or lists. You can think of them as lists, but they're, they're known as arrays. An array in JavaScript has an attribute called length. Now here's an interesting thing. Notice the syntax here, list dot length. Where have we seen that before? Yeah. It turns out that an array is actually an object in JavaScript. Okay? So that means it works the same way. You do dot in order to access its attributes. It also has functions attached to it that we'll, we'll use later on. So good. So um, length will tell you the last index minus one. So here's what I mean by this. Index is the position. In programming, we begin all positions. Well, we've been counting from which number? Zero. Yeah. So that means the position, this position, is which position? Zero. Zero position. That's one position. Two position. Three position and four position. Okay? Um, so length will give you the last position plus one. Make sense? So what is this position? Four plus one is five. So the length of this is five. Okay, so list.length returns five. I can refer to any value within this list by doing this, opening up a bracket, specifying the index, closing the bracket. Knowing that this is the zero index, this is the one index and this is the two index, three index, four index, what value will be returned here? Three, three right? Or in other words, what we're saying is go into this list and get me the value at index 2. 0, 1, 2. That's this guy right here. And we get that back. And we get 3. Is that clear? Okay. So we know how to create a list that has values in it. We know how to figure out the length of the list. We also know how to refer to any value within that list. Okay? Any questions up to this point? Simple? Good. Let's do some recursion then, because we love recursion. Let us print every value in this list. Okay, so let's print the value 1, then let's print the value 2, let's print the value 3, 4, and then 5. In other words, let's get this as the output. Let's have a look at this function and see how it works, okay? So in the first line, you see that we construct a list and store in it the numbers that we want to print, right? So one, two, three, four, five, fine. Here's our function that we create. We call with a zero and my list. Zero is going to be our index, okay? It's going to be the position in the array. So we check to see, is that position equal to the, the length of the array, which if you recall is the last position plus one. So is zero equal to, what is the length of this array? Is zero equal to five? No. Therefore we continue and we print list index, which is zero. So we do list zero, which returns one. Good. So we print one, voila. Then we call ourselves, we recurse, we cycle by doing index plus one, so zero plus one, that would be one, and then the list. So that comes back here again. Now index is one. Is this true? No, because one is not equal to the length, which is five, right? So we skip over and we say list one. 
And what is list one? Two, it's this guy, right? This is the one index. That's the zero index, that's the one index. So we print two, and that's how we get this. Then we do index plus one, which will give me two. I come back here, is two equal to the length of the list? No, I print list index two, which gives me a three. And I keep doing this until I get to a point where I have five plus one, six. I, I come here, sorry, sorry, four plus one, which is five. I come here, is five equal to list.length? Yes. yes. And I return and I'm done. And I get one, two, three, four, five. Yes? Questions so far? No questions. Oh, question. So you could, look, remember how scoping works. Scoping says when we see a list, we check to see does it exist in the local scope. Uh, does it exist in a local scope? Yeah. yeah, it's right there, right? Now you're right that if I didn't do this, it would still work. If I did this. Ah, sorry. I would have to call it my list. One second. There. That works. Why? Because at each iteration, iteration, it's going to try to see, does my list exist within this scope? Yes or no? Yes. It exists within just this scope? No. So it goes up one and finds it there. And it uses that. Make sense? It's the same rule. Everything that we talked about as far as recursion and variable scoping in the previous talks, mm -hmm. same stuff. Nothing changed. Did that make sense to you? Yes. You sure? OK. All right, let's continue. So, it, so writing recursive code requires writing code, right? Um, it turns out that the more code you write, the more errors you will introduce into your code. There's a pretty strong correlation between the size of your code and the number of mistakes in your code. I think by now most of you probably agree with that, right? The more code you write, the more mistakes you make. So the goal of any programmer, any good programmer, is to produce code that does the same thing, but is written in a smaller way, right? Code that isn't very big, right? So write small, clean code that does all the complicated stuff that you want. There's a big difference. This is one of the differences, by the way, between a programmer and a good programmer, right? Um, and this is something you will gain through experience. The more code you write, the more practice you do, the better you'll be able to understand how to structure your, your programs. But so one of the things that we can use in order to cycle over or loop over an array, which is a com very common operation, is to use a function that it has attached to it. So notice here I do my list dot for each. And then I call it. What does that mean? Yeah, so what this means, right, so all correct. What this means is that my list, which is an array, is actually also an object, which has inside of it a key called for each. And that key refers to a function that I call. And what that function will do is it will take as an argument my function and call my function one time for every value inside of the array. Bless you. Did that sort of make sense? Tell you what, why don't we implement the for each? Let's do my list dot my for each. There. And let's call that. Okay. Obviously nothing happened because we didn't do anything. So in here, let's write our recursion, uh, f, which will loop over itself. So this is my list. We want to call the function that is given to us, the func. So we want to call func with my list 
sum index. That index is here. And the second argument, by the way, was index. And then we need a termination case, right? We want to do this, but we want to end it at some point. So what is the termination case here? Anyone? It's the same recursive call we did just before. I is bigger or equal to zero. Uh, I is greater than or equal. Okay. Greater is greater than or equal to zero. What? Is what? Like that? No, we should have a return point. No, it means bigger or larger or equal to. Greater than or equal to, okay. Okay, so now we're going to call f starting with a zero, right? But if I do that, won't it run forever? So how can I change it so it does not run forever? Okay, so let me do zero. Well, we don't have a recursive thing here yet. We have to then call f i plus one, right? Let's see what happens. We did it. So let me explain how this works. My, my for each is attached to my list, right? It's a function. I refer to it here. Questions so far? I call it passing in another function that goes into that guy. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Then what I do is I create a recursive function inside. I call it with a zero. It comes here, i is zero. Is zero equal to the length? No. no. So I call this function, that is to say this function, with my list i. In other words, the zero index of my list, which you can see is one, right? In other words, I pass in one, and I also pass in the index just because, it doesn't matter. And then I recurse, so I do i plus one. That loops around, i had now has a value of one. It used to be zero, now it's one. I check to see, is one the same as the length of my list? No. no. So I call that function, the original function that was given to me, with that in, the value at that index and the index. And I keep doing this over and over again. And this function will simply print that value, which is why we get one, two, three, four, and five. In other words, we print these values here. If one of these becomes text, I will print that. If one of them becomes a boolean, I will print that. Um, if it says if i equals my list length and it's yes. false, why does it then return the function? It doesn't return a function. This right here? So return just means stop, right? Yeah, it's okay? Okay. Other questions? Does everyone understand how this works? Who does not? Okay, two people, three people, four people, five people, five, five, that's it, At six, seven ish. No, because remember, we're, okay, so let's, so if we can't understand code, what's the simplest way to understand it? Yeah, let's debug through it. Hang on. Hang on. Uh, source. Change something. Okay. Let me make this really large. No, hang on. Okay. That's as big as I can go, it seems. Is this okay? Can everyone see the code? Yeah? Okay. So, let's begin. 
We hit next. This will create my list. If I expand it here, I can see that at index 0, I have 1, index 1, I have 2, blah, 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 and the length is 5. You see how the debugger explains everything. It's very nice. Okay, then what I do is to my list, I attach a func I give it a name and I attach to it a function. So my list has this key now with this value. I'll say it again. This is my list. It will have this key and that value. That means in the future, if I do my list dot my for each, I will get back this value here. Is that clear? No question so far. Okay. Then I will call my for each and I will pass to it this argument here, this value. What is that value? What is it? It's a function, right? Yes? Hello? Yes? Hands up if you get this. Okay, put your hands down. Hands up if you do not get this. Okay, the people who just put their hands up last, you don't have to worry about it. Everyone else, I'm going to give you a test. It's going to count towards your grade. Uh, Vazgen is about to pass out some papers. Uh, just put everything off your desk, please. You don't have anything in front of you? Good. Um, and it's going to count towards your grade. Is that okay? You feel comfortable? Okay, I was kidding. It's not really going to happen. Uh, okay. <laughs> Vazgen was like... Oh wait, is he even here? I don't think he's here. <laughs> okay, so that shock that I just... Eh. Um, if, if you ever feel like you understand it, you should be ready to take a test, right? If you're not ready to take a test, if you're not confident to take a test, then there's something that's missing, right? So speak, speak out. If there's something that's missing, tell me. More people should be raising their hands, no problem. Okay, but up until now, I'm not talking about everything else, just up until where I am now, which is to say I have an object, which is an array, I've attached to it a name, and I've put into that name this function that I am now calling. Just that much. Is that clear? Yes? Okay. So now I call that function and I give that function an input, a value, an argument. This argument could have been a number, it could have been boolean, it could have been text. In this case, I'm giving it a function. Clear so far? Yes? So in the last, uh, last sentence, the function has two arguments. For my for each function has value and index. This function here? Yeah. Yes. Very good. Okay, so listen. Don't these arguments belong to this function here. They are an input to the function that is referenced by this name, which is this function here. How many arguments does this function take? One, right? This one? Are you with me? Yes, it does only take one argument. Here's the argument that I've given it. I take this function here, th there's only, I call it, and I pass this whole function as one thing. Okay. This function goes into that. Huh? Anyone else so far? Good, okay. So now, let's step into my for each. So now this func contains this function, right? Okay, so then what we'll do is inside we will create an internal function that we will call f. And let's call f with a zero. Now zero has an i of zero, sorry, i has, an, has a value of zero. My list has a length of five. There it is, right? Length of five. So is i, which is zero, the same as my length, sorry, my, no, right? Because five is not the same as zero. So we skip. We now will call this function, this function, 
with the value at index 0 and the index. Let's step in. Notice how value is now 1 and index, yeah. there it is, index has a value of 0. Is that true? Everything good? Okay. So let's step, and we'll console log the value, which is 1. We then call this function again, but we increment or we pass a value that is 1 greater than the original. So 0 plus 1 is 1. Good. i is now 1. Is 1 the same as my, my list.length? No, because my list dot length will give me five, right? So no, my list i. So the the value at index i is two, right? Sure enough, that's what I get for value. I get two, and for index, I get here. Let's just look here. For index, I get one. For value, I get two. Good. Let's keep going. Let's recurse i is now 2, I do the same for 2, an index of i, I keep going, I keep going, I keep going, but it's done, fin, and that's it. The program is finished. Don't need all that. And in my console, I get 1, 2, yay, true, 5. Fine? Is anyone confused about this now? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, but then you could. But then what you would have to do is you would have to take, yeah, you're right, you could. You could do const. Like that. That's what you're talking about? Yeah, you can do that. So you might be wondering to yourself, why did I attach it to the array, right? So the array has attached on it, it's already sitting on it, lots of functions that know how to use that array. So all I did was to explain for each, I had us implement our own version of for each. That's all. Okay? So now that you know how we wrote it, you should probably guess what for each does. Hang on. Let me refresh. Did it refresh? Okay, so now for each should be fairly clear. For each is a function that, given a function, will call that function for every value inside of our array. That means this function will first get called with the 1, then get called with the 2, then 3, then 4, then 5. Simple? Yes. Questions? No questions. I'll keep going if there are no questions. Okay. I will keep going. We have a map function. So a map function will transform the values of the array and then return at the end a new array having those values. So here's what I mean. I create an array that has 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And I put it into my list. Then I, I do my list.map and I give it a function. That function, just like for each, will get called for every value. So it will get called one with a two, one with a, once with a 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5. Whatever value is returned by this function, will be stored into another array that is then returned by map and then put into my list. Did that make sense to everybody? No. Yeah, <laughs> one person. Yes, it did. Okay. So let me explain one more time. I have a variable. I put a list into this variable containing 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Clear? Good. 
I call this magic function called map. It's attached to the array. Attached to, as in I do the, the name of the array, dot the name of the key, map. That's that. That returns to me a function that I then call, right? There. I give it as an argument, as an input, this value right here. This entire thing is one thing that I give it as a value, a function. What it will do is it will call my function for every value in the array. That means it will call it once with a 1, then a 2, then a 3, then a 4, then a 5. Questions so far? None. Can you just zoom out? Yeah, sure. Good? Okay. This function that I give it is going to return something. It doesn't matter what it returns. It can return, yay. It doesn't matter what it returns. But whatever it returns, that value will get stored inside a different array. That different array will then get returned by this entire thing, by the map function, and then I'm putting it into my list. And then I'm simply iterating over that new array and printing every value inside. In this case, I've returned yay for every value inside the array. Is that clear? Yes. It does a transform. OK. I have an array with, hang on. With those numbers. What I want to do is make an array that where every value is those values multiplied times 2. In other words, I want an array where the first value is 66, the second value is 42, the, second, the third value is 22. Make sense? For every value, I want to transform it. Yeah? Okay. So what I will do then, the way to do that, Remember, value is first 33, then 22, then 11. So I do value times 2. What it will do is it will run this function against this, and then this, and then this, and then return another array that I put in here, and here I'm just printing that array. Yes? Can we use the index here? You can. What would you like to do with the index? In this example, no, but you could come up with examples where you, yeah, you might say, for example, index yeah, index of, I don't know, index has a value of, hang on, index, oh, plus, sorry, there you go, right? You can also do, for example, Hang on. I don't know. Making things up. Is that clear? OK, so for each simply iterates over the array, calling your function one time for every value inside the list. Map allows you to transform the array to take an array that has values and then return a different array that has slightly different values. Is that clear? Sort of? Questions? Yes? Uh, can we name the names value on index uh, whatever name we like? Yeah. So for any variable, you can call it whatever you want. Foo, bar, foo. Yeah, you can, same here. Z, B, Z, B. Okay. Yeah? Yes, sir. Is I just printed a bunch of junk, honestly. Hang on.
what, tell me something you want to do with this list. Some way you want to change it. Let's say for every val, okay, let's say you, ha you have a bunch of things like um, Joe, Yeah, well you want to know their, okay, so let me give a different length. I now want to return a list that has the length of each thing. So I return z, uh, da, 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 z length. There. Now you, can, you get an array where the first value has five because it has five characters, six because six characters, nine because it has nine characters. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, so in this case, B is actually not used. So we could just do this. You're right. It's not a requirement. Yes? So, okay, hang on. So what this is doing is simply taking the value in the array and that's it. It's just giving you that one value and then saying do something with it. And whatever you do that's returned is added to another array. Jogish? Okay, think of it this way. Think of it this way. You have your array. One, six. No, still nothing? Okay, good. Okay, we have this array. It has a 1, a 6, and a 9, right? We want to make another array that somehow changes 1 into some value. 6 into some value and 9 into another value. We have a function that we can call with the 1. Whatever it returns will go here. So we give the function a 1, it returns some value, that goes in here. We call the same function with a 6, whatever it returns, we put it here. We call that function with a 9, whatever it returns, we put it here. And then we return that. All of which I just stated is what happens in the map function. So a map is just a transform. For every value, we run it through a function, we get a different function. So suppose the function that I want to run it through multiplies the given value times 2. Right? So I have a function f. If you call f with a 1, it will do 2 times 1, which is 2. Then it will call f with a 6, 2 times 6, 12, etc., etc. What that means is that if I run this through f, I'll get 2 times 1, which is 2, 12, 18. And then this is returned as the result. That's all map does. Did that make a bit more sense? Eh? Who's confused? Yes. Nothing. Questions about the map function? Yes. Uh-huh. Hang on, sorry. Say that one more. So, yeah, just print print ten times which element? Hang on. So let me try to follow what you're saying. So you want to create some function. Hang on. What's the argument to the function? I'm confused. What are you trying to do? Also. Love. Ha. But it's a in short fixed fixed on it. Բայց աստղերի բանը դեպք նույնը չեր, աստղերի նա թող լինի տար, դու իրան տալիս էր թիվ, ինքը այդքան աստղեր չէ տպում, ճիշտեմ ասում, 
Աստղիտը է գրի A, նույն բանը չի ստացում։ Չէ, այն ինչ-որ դու ես ասում, ու մի խիչ ուրիշա, դու ռիքրսիվ, կոհասացը մի խիչ ուրիշա, դու արեյով մի խարնորի։ Ըկեի, other questions or concerns, don't worry if you didn't get that, it's okay. Other questions or concerns about map? Don't worry, if you didn't quite, yeah, is there a question? Sure. So for each does the same as map, but it what it doesn't matter what you return. It will simply call your function once for every value. That's it. That's all it does. The difference is is that map returns a new array of the values that you've returned. For each simply says, I'm going to call your function. Do whatever you want. Make sense? It's very similar. You're right there, but it's also different. Questions? No. Let's keep going. There's also a filter. This one is used all the time. So a filter is a pretty cool function. You give it a list. When you call the list with a filter and you give it a function, if the function returns true, it will keep the value. If it returns false, it will not keep the value. It will then return another array that will only have the values for which you returned true. So let me explain. So I have a list 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I do my list.filter, I give it a function. The function is first called with 1. Is 1 bigger than 3? No. So that's a false, right? So we don't count 1. It does it again. Runs it, gives the take this two, puts it here. Is two bigger than three? No. So it doesn't count it. Keep going. Is three bigger than three? No. Doesn't count it. Keep going. Is four bigger than three? Yes. So it keeps it. Is five bigger? Yes. Keeps that, returns an array with four and five. Does that make sense? Yes. So it's a quick way of taking a list and only taking out of it what you want. Got it? Okay. That's it. That's all the filter is. One more time. So let's uh, change this a bit. Value is equal to A. This will now only return a list that has one value in it. That is, to, that is this value here. Right? Because A is A, true, false, false, so it's only going to return an array that has this one value. Right, so you will, you're basically, you're getting another array that only has A in it and C in it, but not B. You guys see this? Can anyone give me an example of where you might use a filter? Uh, where have you seen any kind of application where, a f what is it? Control F and so searching, okay. Uh, so searching is a little, you're not taking things out though, right? You're still seeing the entire UI. You're just finding the location of something. Think of a place where when you type, things go away and you only keep what matches. Search systems, yeah. Think of a, like Facebook chat. Right? So you have a list of people. Right? So these are your friends. And then you, I think you have like a little search here, right? Where you can filter down your, your people so you can find who you want to message. And if you type their name, this filter starts to filter down to only people who match that name. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So think of each one of these things. Now each one of these things is probably an object that has name, picture, a whole bunch of stuff in it, right? So you have an array of objects. And filter will simply filter out the things that don't match your, your text search. And it will re-render and it will only render the part that matches. <coughs> Make sense? Okay. 
Give me an example where you might want to use a map function. That is to say you want to take a list and you want to transform it. You want to change it into another list. Calculate your GPA. Uh, yeah. If I have a list of all the students, and each student is an object that has all of their grades in it, I can then return another array that just has their, the GPA for each student. Right. Another one is, let's say I give you an array in Fahrenheit, and you want to give me an array where all the values are in Celsius. Right? So that would be a transform, a mapping. So think of a map as like a thing that says go from here to here. Right? So you're mapping. You're taking a list and you're turning it into another list. Map. Give me an example where you might want to just iterate over a list. That's what for each will do, right? It will call your function once for every index in an array. What's an example? When would you ever want to iterate over a list? Print the list. Yeah, okay, that's an easy one, right? You might want to just print the list. Sure, give me another one. You want to what? You want to find something, yeah, but you can use filter to find something, right? You could use filter. You could just say, like, return a boolean. If it's found, return true. If not, false. And then return just a list that matches your search. What's another one? Yes? When you want to find what? Ah, you want to round it up. Okay, but so I understand what you're saying, but the problem is you would, okay, you would have to break up your number into individual values and store it in a list. Yeah, then you could, you're right, you could maybe do that. You could actually do a filter there where you, the moment you hit the dot, you, you stop, and then every, everything is false after that, then you only, and then you join. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. So I was thinking filter only because you might have like two, five, dot three one and you might say true keep it true keep it the moment you hit false like this flip it to false and do false 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 and only keep this did that make sense that's why i was thinking filter maybe which one in code this one specifically I just realized, so to do this, you need to modify a variable, which we will, we're about to get to modifications of variables that's coming up, but I, just not yet. We're almost there. Um, but other questions about filter, map, or for each? No? Okay. I'm going to hold off on this. So there's a last one. So typically, whenever you talk about it doing work on a list, you have filter, map, uh, filter, map, uh, for each, and reduce. And reduce is actually the most powerful out of all of them. You can do everything that all the other ones do using reduce. The problem is it's also the hardest to understand. So for now, I'll hold off on this. I'll let you guys work with the other ones first. And then once you understand that, then we'll talk about reduce. So we'll skip this for now. OK. We can finally continue. Moment. Wait, 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 wait. This is reduce. Yeah, in reduce you have three. But again, we'll talk about that another, another day. Hello.
Uh, that's sort of All right, whatever. I'll just do it freestyle. Okay. So the, up until this point, everyone can see the code. So up until this point, we were talking about variables that are constant, right? That is to say variables that cannot change. Once you've made it, you can't modify it. So remember, again, a variable is just a name given to a value. And all we're saying with a constant is that you can't change that. You can't give that name to another value. Once you've assigned it to a value, that's it. You're done. Apparently, you can actually specify a variable that can change. Now, there are two ways to do this in JavaScript, var and let. We will use let. The diff so what's the difference? What's the difference? So the difference is, is that with a, we can do a is equal to a plus 2. For example, we can do just assign it to something else. We can assign it to a completely different type. So in the first line, we've assigned 2 into A, right? We've put 2 into A. What is the type of A in the first line? It's a number. Then we put, we change its value. We put in a different value, right? We put in text. The type now is string, yeah. So what this means is that the type of the variable is dictated by its value. It's determined by its value. This is known as dynamic typing. So the type is determined by the value. And the type can change. In other programming languages that you will study, like Java, you can't do that. When you make a variable, you have to say this is going to be a number. And that's it. It has to be a number. You can't then change it and put text into it. In JavaScript, you can, right? Because we have dynamic typing. So we can do things like, what if I did const here? Anyone know what would happen? That's right. There's an error. See, it didn't print. There's an error thrown. So in order for me to change it, I have to do that. Is that clear? Intro? So if you're using const and you want to store the value somewhere, you have to create another variable. This way I'm not modifying A, I'm just creating another one, right? But if it's not a const, I, bless you, I can actually modify the value of A. Does that make sense? Yes. Hey, Chemism. Yes. There is. Yes. It has to do with scoping. So var, if you're asking the question, you probably maybe know low JavaScript. So var is, has functional scope. Let has block scope. Block is those curly braces. So if you do a for loop, for example, which we'll study later, let is only inside of that loop, not outside. But if var, it's everywhere inside the function. That's the difference. Um, but typically, in most programming languages, we have block scope. So because we're going to be learning Java, which is block scope, it's a good idea to just learn block scope everywhere. So we're learning block scope here with let. Other questions? Yes? It takes the current value. So think of it this way. Let's debug. OK, so a has a value of 2, right? See here? When we do a is equal to a plus 2, it means take a plus 2 and put it into a, right? Now it has a value of 4. 
Now it has a value of 10. Now it has a value of 20. Now we print A. What is A? Make sense? If I were to instead print here, so remember, code runs top down. Just think of it that way. Questions on this so far? No. OK, we have a bit of time. Let's play. So there's, let me show you guys a trick. Um, it's a trick worth knowing. So very often, you will see people doing um, a is equal to a plus 1. Right? Yeah, exactly. It turns out you can do a plus equals 1. This operation is exactly the same as this operation. So plus equals means add this and whatever comes to the right of it and set it back on itself. It's syntactic sugar. OK, let me ask you this. Suppose a, I want to multiply a times 10, and I want to put it into a. Other, other than the two people, huh? Oh, no? OK, I'm listening. Beautiful. Exactly. So this and this means the same thing. Does that make sense? OK. There is one more trick. It's a common trick, but it's a dangerous trick. I will show it to you so when you see it, you know it. But be careful using it. If I want to add 1 to a, I can either do a equals a plus 1, or I can do a plus equals 1, or I can do a plus plus. Very good. Or plus plus a. Hands up if you know about these two things. Keep, it, keep them up. Uh, Put your hands down if you cannot explain the difference. Wow. It's not the sign of A, right? Wait, 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 wait. Hang on, I want to see. I'm looking at you. Green, uh, green, yeah, hi. What's the difference? Very good, yeah. So there's a nuance between these two, uh, which is that in this operation, A is modified only after the expression is complete. Whereas in here, A is first modified, and then the, the expression continues to run. OK, listen. Try not to use these. And the reason why I'm telling you not to use this is because I've seen too many interviews, programming interviews, where people have made a mistake of using this instead of this or this instead of this. It's very easy to make a mistake. So instead, don't make the mistake. In fact, try not to modify your variables at all if you can. Everywhere where you can, just use a constant. This is why I started off by telling you guys about constants, and now I'm telling you about let. Always try to write your code using constants. Then, if you feel like you really have to, then and only then should you use a let. OK? So your code should have lots of constants, and then maybe an occasional let. Yes? OK. We have, yes, between this and this, sure. So suppose we do console.log a++. So let's put that into like a separate thing. Um, notice how, what, what's a++ supposed to do? Add a one, right? So why did I get four? Exactly. Now watch this. Wait, wait. Wait for it. 
Il n'y a pas Oui, 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 oui. Right. So here's what happens. A plus plus will first run this and then modify A, which is why A here is already three. But here, it's still two. So this whole thing runs two plus two, and then two increments to three. Yes? What if we cancel A plus 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 A? Will it now modify A plus 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 A. Meet up there, A plus plus plus. So that will, so, it all, so this happens after this, right? So this, this, think of it this way. The second time you refer to the variable, it's already complete. Does that make sense? But not the first. If you change it though, if you put the plus plus before, it will first change A and then add it to 2. So it will be A, so change A to 3, and then 3 plus 2. Hmm? Questions? None. Easy? Good. Let's take a photo. Barast? Artsokov Karen. Hey! John. Bravo.